I'm Marvin Natevich. I'm a medical geneticist and researcher at the Cleveland Clinic, and we're privileged today to have Dr. Lauren Moskowitz here. Dr. Moskowitz is an assistant professor of psychology at St. John's University. Uh, she has special expertise in working with persons with uh, autism and persons with anxiety, and she has special research interests in positive behavior support and behavioral interventions in uh, anxiety. She's going to speak to us today about anxiety in persons with autism spectrum disorders and the objectives today with Dr. Moskowitz will discuss when to refer uh, persons with anxiety for further evaluation and clinical care. Now most often we conceptualize anxiety as an intrinsic behavior but in your practice or in the literature uh, does one often encounter medical conditions that are the cause of anxiety or side effects of medications as a cause of anxiety and how do you incorporate those ideas into your practice? Well, I mean I think you know, I, I think those probably those medical conditions might be treated a little bit differently, but I think any anxiety that resulted from them would be treated similarly, regardless of the cause. For example, we often we don't really often we're never going to know the cause of anxiety. Let's say a child just to make it really basic. Let's say a child has a dog phobia, for example. It's possible they've had some bad experience with a dog in their life that caused that dog phobia, but more often than not there's no bad experience we could identify that caused that phobia, right? They just have it. <laughs> but the good thing about anxiety treatment is regardless of what's causing the anxiety, you would treat it the same way with those procedures I described. So regardless of why you are afraid of dogs, um, whether you had a bad experience with the dog or not, you would treat it the same way by gradually exposing the individual to dogs, you know, starting out with maybe pictures of dogs, videos of dogs, looking at a dog from far away, um, looking at a dog closer and closer, eventually maybe even petting the dog. So they'd be working their way up to, again, confronting the situation. Um, essentially, the message you're trying to convey as a parent, teacher, doctor, whomever, is you're trying to really reinforce or reward brave behavior, encourage brave behavior, and trying to discourage avoidant behavior, because avoidance is what maintains anxiety. So, Dr. Moskowitz, normally we think about anxiety as, you know, intrinsic behavior, but uh, there sometimes can be um, medical conditions that can present with panic attack or, or uh, anxiety might be a secondary consequence of certain medications. How do you incorporate these notions in your clinical practice? Mm -hmm. Well, when we're first assessing a child, we, we definitely make sure to do a thorough history, developmental history, educational history, medical history, et cetera. And we almost always talk to their teachers, their primary care providers, you know, their pediatricians, um, to try to get a sense of what any, uh, you know, uh, contributing factors c could be. Um, certainly, you know, you, you always want to rule out if there's any medical conditions that, that could be contributing, um, you know, because it could be that the side effects of a certain medication could be causing an individual to have rapid heartbeat um, rather than a panic attack per se. So you just want to make sure to try to rule out that there's medical causes of these symptoms that could present as anxiety, uh, especially med medication side effects. Um, I would say most often the kids and adults who do come to me are kids who have been seen, who this has been ruled out in already. You know, they've come to me because often parents or teachers do think it's, oh my God, they're dying, they're having a heart attack or an adult or something like that, and they go to doctors and they find that there isn't necessarily something medically wrong, which is often what leads them to a psychologist um, trying to figure out what's accounting for this. Because especially with panic attacks, the most people think they're dying. I mean, that's exactly what a panic attack feels like. You feel like you're dying. So often, um, I would say, you know, 97% of the time the individuals who come to us are individuals who have seen doctors already and the medical piece has been ruled out. But we will certainly make sure that that it's, you know, that, that um, medical considerations have been ruled out before we would start proceeding with the behavioral treatments. Um, and Dr. Moskowitz, mm -hmm. if medical considerations 
have been thought of and mm -hmm. felt to have been ruled out. Mm -hmm. And the idea that a medication that a patient may already have been on mm -hmm is not likely to be cause of a person's anxiety and you think mm -hmm. it's an intrinsic behavior, what are things that physicians can do or can offer uh, for persons with autism who mm -hmm. have anxiety who are afraid of undergoing physical exams or various mm -hmm. procedures? Mm -hmm. Certainly in neurotypical individuals, you know, those who are not on the spectrum, there's been a recent large, a large study, the CAM study, which has shown that uh, treatments using SSRI, um, a combined treatments using SSRI and CBT combined is more effective than either alone. So who knows, there might be something similar like that going on for kids on the spectrum, although in general, SSRIs, medications, in general, are a lot less well-researched um, in children on the spectrum. So it, you know, we can't say that for sure, but certainly these are, psychiatrists can think about how um, medication can be combined with behavioral treatments. Um, in terms of, in general, what should physicians do when, when individuals are in their office, office um, I would say clinically what I've seen a lot also from working in, in hospitals is individuals on the spectrum, and, and certainly just go from going to doctor's office, they're often restrained. You know, they're scared of the doctor, <laughs> they're scared of the dentist, um, and think about it. If you couldn't really talk, or even if you could talk but had a really hard time expressing yourself, and you're brought into this place where people are prodding you and poking you and sticking at you, it hurts, and you don't know why, that must be terrifying. That must be absolutely terrifying. And so what you see is a lot of problem behavior often surrounding doctors and dentist visits, and certainly when they're brought in the hospital, um, we, when I worked in the hospital, we would see a lot of problem behavior, um, for sure. And I think the most common response to that is restraint. Um, often these individuals either, you know, uh, some form of uh, actual physical restraint or, or chemical restraint w was often used. And that can sometimes feed into the problem in that one of the things that contributes to anxiety is a feeling of uncontrollability. You know, we know from even animal studies that animals who are able to control their shock exhibit less uh, fear like behaviors than those who, who than those who can't control their shock. So control is an important aspect. So one thing I would try to do as a doctor is um, when working with parents is figure out ways we can give these children some kind of or, or adults some kind of control over their environment. Um, Jane Carlson, a, a former student of my doctoral uh, uh, mentor, uh, she had her whole di wonderful dissertation on uh, desensitization to. Um, doctor and dentist appointments, um, where they used a combination of some of the things I mentioned. So they used functional communication training, you know, teaching the individuals to ask for a break, um, or ask them to stop, ask the doctors to stop when they were afraid, um, and they needed a short break, and obviously, you know, fading out those breaks over time. That was one thing they used. They used, uh, <laughs> presenting discriminative stimuli, what's called for non-problem behavior, meaning whatever those things are that are associated with all of their not problem behavior, with all of their kind of happy and good behavior, whether it's potato head, for example, or Harry Potter, whatever it is, presenting all those things at the doctor to again kind of create a more positive association with the doctor or dentist. And this is something, again, I use clinically for all, all of my children. I think I mentioned the example of pairing the the doctor with potato head, which was probably one of the most powerful interventions I've seen for a child who it would take six doctors and nurses to hold him down at the doctor's office. As soon as his favorite thing, potato head, only lived at the doctor, and that was the only place he could get it. Not a home, not anywhere else, not the car, just the doctor. That made this child actually want to go to the doctor. <laughs> and so, this is in some ways what makes individuals on the spectrum easier than uh, I'm thinking my own two-year-old daughter who I can't get to like the doctor. And, and there's nothing she likes as much as this child like potato head, to be honest. And so I think sometimes that's an advantage of working with individuals on the spectrum. They have strong loves, strong, strong loves, and you can capitalize on those. Um, so that's something you can do as a doctor, certainly um, incorporating their per special interests into the doctor's office, presenting these positive, these stimuli that have known positive associations, especially during the difficult parts, whether it's looking in their ear, um, presenting them choices whenever possible. That's something Jane Carlson also did in her dissertation, something we use clinically a lot. Again, these individuals have a profound lack of control over their environment often. Things are thrust upon them without 
they're, they're having any say in the matter. So presenting choices is something that can help. Do you want to be in this exam room or this exam room? Uh, should I look in your, your left ear or your right ear first? You can find a way to inject choices and some sort of control into anything you're doing. Um, should we do this first or this first? Do you want mom to sit and hold your hand or dad? Whatever it is, you can find some way to give this individual some control over their environment. That's another very powerful strategy. Um, those are those are I would say some of the main ones. And Dr. Um, Moskowitz, yes. could you reiterate some of the things that physicians should not do for persons with mm -hmm. autism who have anxiety? Right. Taking well control, I would say, is one of the big ones. Um, yelling at them certainly. I know I know it should go without saying, but I'm just thinking of a child with autism who was in the hospital where I had worked and he kept saying, Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson. He just wanted Michael Jackson during you know and Michael and they just kept saying, No Michael Jackson, no Michael Jackson. So that was escalating his anxiety and escalating. Um, so I wouldn't just say no something, even if it's not something you can provide, present an alternative to okay we can't have Michael Jackson now, but do you wanna hold your favorite SpongeBob toy or do you want to do this now during your procedure? Um, presenting individuals with choices of what they the can choice do. choice and some control. Some control, again, I would always say, um, rather than, again, making them feel completely powerless in that situation, I would say is, is a really important thing to do. Thinking about how you can make the situation more pleasant for them, but even more over how you can make them feel brave and how you can increase their coping behaviors in some way. And this is, again, something parents can do as well as doctors can do. You can be a coping model rather than a, what's called a mastery model, you know, acting like everything's easy for you. You know, like what I told my little girl thought, even Harry Potter is brave not because he's not afraid of anything, but because he's afraid of things and fights his fear anyway. That's the message you're trying to instill as, a, instill as a parent or teacher or doctor that it's okay to be afraid and you still have the ability to cope with it. You can, you can do something about it. You can still face your fears and be brave. So you're trying to do a lot of modeling and reinforcing of brave behavior as a doctor or a teacher or a parent or whomever is working. And Dr. Moskowitz, what, what could you tell us that physicians should advise parents of children with autism who have anxiety? What, what should docs tell the parents? Well, um, I think I would say, you know, some, some of the same things. I mean, certainly if there is, I would, re, I would have the doctors refer the parents for cognitive behavioral therapy if, if there is some significant impairment um, in their life. And, and I guess what I mean by that is, uh, you know, it's, I'm afraid of spiders. It's okay to be afraid of spiders, I think. <laughs> um, but one of my girls with autism was so afraid of spiders that she wouldn't go to the bathroom in school because there might be spiders there. So she was urinating on herself all the time because she was so afraid to go in the bathroom that there might be spiders. There's real impairment there. <laughs> and so when you see that level of impairment, you, also, you often, you know, it's not necessarily something parents might be able to deal with on their own. In those instances, I, I would really have them seek out cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Um, ideally with someone who's experienced you know, treating kids with autism. I think the other thing that I would say um, for doctors to tell parents, like I said, is to, you know, the, the, the inclinations to avoid it, but like I would say, uh, you know, I would have them again not avoid situations that make them anxious. So, so most often when kids with autism or kids without autism, but especially when kids with autism come to see me, they have been told to avoid by everyone in their life. I, I think I mentioned before, a, um, a girl with autism I worked with who was afraid of thunder and lightning and her teacher and prior therapist had had her put on headphones whenever there was a thunderstorm. So what that's teaching her is thunder is something to be afraid of and she can't cope with it, right? And you want to instill as a parent the opposite message that thunder might be scary but you can cope with that. So you could start out wearing headphones and maybe listening to music, but gradually over time lower the volume on those headphones to the point where you're taking off the headphones so that eventually you're helping that child gradually to cope with something that makes them anxious um, rather than think that they have to avoid it for their whole life. So I, I think that's the main message you're trying to send parents that you're, you know, you're trying to help your kid cope with things that make them anxious and show them they can be brave and fight it and model that yourself as a parent instead of, a, I remember one mom I worked with, you know, she was like, I was terrified of skiing, but I didn't want to tell her that. I said, well, no, tell your child that. Say, you see how we just went skiing? I was really scared of that and I did it anyway because I was trying to be brave. And I, that's the kind of message you want to send as a parent. And Dr. Moskowitz, nearly all primary care physicians, nearly all pediatricians, have in their practices persons 
with autism, many of whom mm -hmm. will um, have anxiety. When should um, those clinicians refer and to whom should they refer such patients with anxiety? Generally, uh, you should refer to a psychologist or licensed you know, mental health provider um, who specializes in CBT when the anxiety is so severe that there's you know, avoidance, substantial avoidance, distress, but most of all when there's some sort of interference or functional impairment. Um, like I mentioned in the example of the spider, I'm afraid of a spider, but there's not actual impairment in my life. It's not interfering with any aspect of my life. It's not keeping me from doing anything. So when you see all of those things, the interference, um, the distress, the avoidance, that's when you as a doctor really want to refer them to that makes sense. a psychologist or someone who is specialized in that. But if you're in doubt, in my opinion, better to, better to refer certainly for treatment even if it may not reach that level of clinical significance because you don't want to overlook anxiety as we know often again happens in kids with autism. So if you're in any doubt and think something might be anxiety um, or even, you know, like I said, it can be hard to prove necessarily in these kids and discriminate it from other behaviors. So if you're in any doubt at all, I, I would certainly say to refer them. One final question, if yeah. that's okay. Yeah, of course. As someone with years of expertise in the field, what do you consider the major clinical research questions that need answering? Well, I think um, one of the things, like we said, is on how to how to identify it, especially in those kids who are minimally verbal um, or who have an intellectual disability. It can be really hard to tease apart the symptoms of anxiety um, from the symptoms of ASD. You know, to tease apart social avoidance, let's say, that's classic ASD, from social anxiety. Or to tease apart, you know, a, re a repetitive behavior, is that a ritual you'd see in OCD or is that, you know, part of autism? So it can be really, really hard to tease the, some of those symptoms apart, especially because some recent evidence um, from kind of Kearns, Phil Kendall, sh um, shows that there might be a lot of atypical presentation of anxiety in these kids that might not conform to the DSM. Um, you know, it could be more fear of fear of change, fear of transitions, um, or maybe the social phobia, for example, doesn't have that fear of ridicule by other people. It's just a general sort of fear of interaction with other people. So there's a lot of differences maybe in how it presents itself. I think that's one of the big open questions. How does it really present itself differently? How can we really identify it, especially in those kids who can't tell us what's going on? Sure. Um, but then the even bigger question that I'm interested in is, again, how do we necessarily go about uh, treating it? Um, there, ha Like I said, there's been a lot of really great, wonderful RCTs of randomized controlled trials of CBT showing that it is very effective for children with autism spectrum disorders, um, children and adolescents. Um, but all of those studies are children um, with an IQ, like I said, above 75, above 80. So one of the things I'm really interested in is how do we address anxiety in children who, who are minimally verbal and or who have a comorbid intellectual disability. So. And do we know much about adults with autism who and may have anxiety? There's not much at all on adults, right, exactly. Um, the, the CBT studies that I just mentioned are all on children or adolescents. To my knowledge, none of them are on adults. Um, to my knowledge. Yeah. But yeah, that's again something that really needs to be uh, needs to be explored. Well, Dr. Moskowitz, thanks very much for this really helpful session. Thanks.